friends, uh, welcome, and we're very grateful to the opening speakers who have oriented us and gotten us off to uh, a great start. Um, I came to my first wider conference uh, 20 years ago or so. Um, it was on this very topic, uh, which was newly fashionable at the time, and uh, it was an incredibly exciting conference. And I know Kunal and his colleagues have worked very hard to make this one at least as exciting for uh, all of us in the room. Um, you may know a little bit about the history of WIDER, but it emerged as the first of the research institutes away from Tokyo of the UN University. It was something the Finnish government had very much wanted to create. Uh, they've been wonderful partners for UNU ever since, from start to today. Um, and the f there were several founding spirits behind it, but the perhaps most dominant one was Amartya Sen. And indeed, one, the first director of the institute was one of his closest associates. He went on associating himself uh, with WIDER, and the last conference I attended, perhaps four years ago, uh, Amartya attended also, and was in fierce uh, participation uh, throughout the conference. Not long ago, I was in Cambridge. I went to see him. Uh, the only thing he really wanted to know from me was, how Wider was doing. So his heart is still with the institution, and I wanted you to know he's well, and he and Emma were living comfortably in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but obviously not traveling much uh, at the moment. Uh, we have a wonderful uh, panel, and I'd like to uh, introduce them uh, to you. We have next to me uh, Speciosa Kazibwe, who goes actually by Speciosa or Spe, and we are extremely fortunate that you were kind enough to join us. It's never easy coming to Europe from Africa. It often means picking up a visa in another country. It means changing planes. It means all of the things that are stressful in international travel and uh, Spey was kind enough to overcome them from the outset and to be with us uh, today. She was executive vice president of her country, held several, or her country is Uganda, I should add. Um, uh, she was a cabinet minister several times, but above all, I think she's been an activist throughout her life, and that's what makes her the person she is. Whether she's in government or somewhere else, uh, she's an activist, and we admire that very much. Uh, Séverine Autesser is um, in New York, normally, can be found at Barnard College. She's uh, a professor uh, of Columbia University in the uh, a political science chair. Uh, she writes nonstop for journals, but also helpfully with the news media, and she intervenes on the news media. And uh, she's developed one of the most individual and exciting voices in the field. So, Severine, thank you also for being uh, with us. Um, Jana uh, Talas is director of the Crisis Management Institute, uh, which is uh, also the Marti Atesari Peace Foundation. Uh, you may remember that Marti Atesari was president of Finland for a good number of years until quite recently, but much more importantly to the UN and to Africa, he was the man who led Namibia to independence in very, very difficult circumstances on behalf of the UN, uh, with constant threats of war breaking out all over again, uh, which he was successful in facing down. And uh, he also 
has been an activist throughout his life for peace in his case. Uh, and in many ways, he incarnates Finland on the global stage still. So Jana um, directs the uh, institute that carries uh, Marti's name. Uh, and um, uh, he uh, was a diplomat himself. Uh, the institute is quite new. Um, and it's going to be interesting to learn a little bit about it uh, from uh, Jana. Finally, uh, Mirko's had a wonderful career, at least it looks wonderful on paper, but I suspect <laughs> it's been even better in person. Uh, he's uh, currently the special envoy of the UN Secretary General in Mozambique, but just before that, he was his country, Switzerland's ambassador in Mozambique. So he's had a very long run of developing expertise, connection within the country. Um, and before that, he worked for the Swiss Foreign Service and also very creditably for the ICRC, one of Switzerland's greatest creations, because it was created in Switzerland. Uh, and by a Swiss uh, humanitarian. Uh, and so it's wonderful to have you here. Uh, I thought just to set the stage, uh, I'd turn first to uh, Severine. Now, it's uh, difficult to be very brief on the subjects we're talking about, but uh, I wanted to ask you, Severine, uh, you, you know you have, 20 years or so of experience now on peace building. You've worked in you know, very fragile environments as well as uh, leading cities of the world. Uh, in just a few sentences, could you tell us about the central thesis of your recent book, which is called The Front Lines of Peace? And that will tell us a lot about peace building, I'm sure. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Manon. And uh, thanks to Patricia and to the entire organizing team for putting together this wonderful panel, for inviting me. So uh, it's a perfect transition from what we heard uh, during the panel before, because the central theme of my work uh, is, is really rooted in, uh, in what we were talking about, the fact that two billion people live under the threat of violence, we have uh, people living uh, in, in very fragile situations in more than 50 countries around the world. And if you actually look at the numbers of war, uh, most of half of all ongoing wars have already lasted for more than 20 years. If uh, you go to places where people are living in fragile and, and war-torn countries, you see that many inhabitants are really fed up with the apparent inability of governments, peacekeepers, and international institutions to end violence. And uh, so I've, I've written several, uh, two books and, and, and quite a few articles on what has gone wrong and why we can't stop war. Uh, but the newest book is a bit more positive, and it's looking at what has gone right. And uh, it turns out that, if you want the central thesis, it turns out that elections don't build peace, and democracy itself uh, may not be the golden ticket, at least not in the short term. So what I argue is that contrary to what most politicians preach, Building peace doesn't require billions in aid or massive international interventions. Instead, it often involves giving power to ordinary people. Ultimately, many successful, of, many successful examples of peace building in the past few years, they've all involved innovative grassroots initiatives led by local people and sometimes supported by foreigners often using methods shunned by the international elite. So rather than focusing on abstract peace agreements and handshakes between president and rebel leaders um, and negotiations organized in, in, in big international conference centers, um, my latest work uh, and my new book, The Front Lines of Peace, details the concrete everyday actions that actually make a difference on the ground. 
and some of them are bizarre. Some are creative. Some involve age old traditions and some are just common sense. And in my work, I explain how peace building can work better so that we can finally improve the lives of billions of people. And I show that to end violence from war and also to address violent conflicts at home, whether home is Helsinki or New York or Kampala or saint georges de Montaigu or Kichanga, we have to fundamentally change the way we view and build peace. Great, Sabrine, that's a wonderful intro. And now, Spey, the view from the ground. You've been on the ground your whole life. What could you tell us about what you think is important about peace building and what you have tried to do? Thank you very much, and uh, I want to say thank you to Finland and uh, the CMI, because I've been associated with that organization at the African Union. But I also want to say thanks to the rest of the world, because it's like a classroom for some of us who are activists. Now, as far as uh, I know, if you don't want peace badly, nobody will give it to you. I have realized that since I was at university during Idi Amin's days, and that uh, you do get people who will want to want peace badly, irrespective of the threat, and they have to be within that country. And they have to take action themselves. And then other people can come in to help. And I, I found in my little experience that when you get people across families, across villages, across communities, across borders, who want peace badly, not as a career, but a feeling of humanity, then I think you'll be able to create a consortium of people who want peace badly, and then people will see them and live up to their expectations because they will infect them with them wanting to want peace badly. I have seen this even in the women and gender area in that you may say women have to be, women have to be, but if the women don't want it badly, you will just have across generations huh? until you again want women who want peace badly. The other thing I have seen in my experience, because uh, I was telling Severine here that I'm a perpetual student, because I'm curious and I get easily bored, and uh, I like to find out what is it that I, I don't know, that I can add to myself, because I have to want it badly, therefore I have to understand it, is the fact, she said, we focus on politicians. Do the politicians want peace badly? Or it is their, what would you call it? It's their work to not want peace so that they create all these conflicts to just stay in power because some of them say, the city is very sweet. How do I actually stay in this peace? How do I become relevant? So I say, we have to want peace badly. And I, I think you can feel me. <laughs> because I have seen so much conflict, even in my personal life, in my village, in my country, in my region, and internationally. And that's why I stay looking <clears throat> young. Because I want to go when I have seen more and more people <laughs> wanting peace. Because we all know here, and it's say, been said, without peace, you cannot have development, you cannot have everything. In my country, one of the reasons uh, people continue to vote for President Museven, I don't think that should be the issue. He should also say, let me also get some people who want peace badly for my country and leave others to do something. But they say, we can sleep. What, what does that mean? 
without sleep, your whole body is completely gone. It's a, you, you, you get diseased. We, 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 we sleep, which means we can think when we wake up. We shall know what we want. So really, at the root of it, what this villager is saying is, I want peace so badly for me to be able to do other things. So this is... Uh, uh -huh. Apologies for the interruption. Go no, ahead. I, yes, I thought that, you know, I love dancing. I thought, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing, if I may say, is that we have to also learn that we need to embrace diversity. That diversity may be anthropological diversity, which means bring in expertise in that area. That diversity may be in cultural or even language diversity, because div language carries us forward, especially for us in our countries, where we don't write much. The cultural, the language. So at the end of it all, we are now saying, let's decolonize every profession, every element of life, so that we are able to embrace and get hold of that diversity which we can put on the table. And I believe researchers can speak to that in a more coherent manner. Right. So that the, 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 finally, you as a peace activist, and this is where I, can I call you my daughter, my new daughter? <laughs> you, you know, she, she immersed herself in DRC and she entered the shoes of these people. And that is where I tell my sisters and uh, the support we get from CMI that, uh, you know, let us get these people to teach the experts, the villagers to teach, because many times I'm now a community worker. And I sit in the village and I speak to these people. Then the government comes and says, we are going to put so much money in this parish or this village. But the people say, no, for me, it's education for my children. That is where I, because when I know my child is going to have a future, even if I have that little income, because usually it's really peanuts, which won't make much difference. It's the health. How do I get healthy? Let's get down there and get people to start with where they are. And then I think we may be able to make some little difference because we can ne never make all the difference. <clears throat> And this is where you, the professors, have a lot of work to do. Immerse yourselves there and don't work in silos. Don't work in silos. Please, the villager does not know this, does not. They just know that this is what I want and they see us in the same picture. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Spe. Now, Jana, uh, there are many organizations around the world, but each one tries to find a clear mission. And because yours is relatively new, and it's an opportunity to introduce it also to um, our audience and our audience online as well, with whom we hope to be connecting in a few minutes, could you tell us what's, what its core purpose is? Is it a research organization? Is it an activist organization? Over to you, Jan. Uh, thank you. Thank you, David. And thank you, uh, Vider and David, for putting together such a great panel. Uh, with, with, I'm very honored to be sitting here and listening very carefully what these great colleagues are telling about the CMI that I have had the honor and pleasure of leading for about a year. It is an um, organization that its core belief is that every conflict can be resolved. And that's something I want you to stop to think and, and can commit yourself to that idea because that is something that is very central for us and that stems from President Ahtesari's legacy and his work. That is what he believed and that's kind of the only thing you have to believe. That is the litmus test of getting to work for us. If you don't believe that, it is just because you need to have a certain degree of optimism in order to, to engage, uh, engage this world. We have enough people, a lot of people believe that. Uh, we have 70 people working in Helsinki. Uh, we have been working uh, and steadily growing for 20 years. 
I've been leading for one year, but the CMI has been around for 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, we are quite uh, we are on, of the independent actors, of the conflict building actors, we are come the, the, uh, the top end. We are one of the leaders in the world. Our yearly turnover is about 12 million euros and we work in many areas of the world and with many experts and we have some great experts here <laughs> on, on the podium who, who have worked us. What, what is really what sets us apart is really that we believe that every conflict can be resolved. Another aspect that is very dear to us, we are very uh, kind of uh, cooperation oriented. This, I think, stems from the President Ahtisari's own background, which is UN. We typically work with UN, with EU, with OSC, with African Union, with the ASEAN. So we attach ourselves and work together and we sometimes, I jokingly uh, say to my colleagues that if we cannot build the peace, peace, we strengthen the multilateral organization. And that is very much in our DNA. And I see David uh, smiling at me because he gave me one uh, more than 10 years ago. We share one piece of history together. He was a deputy ambassador of, of Canada in New York, and I was of Finland. And I remember when I got the job, David told me that's one of the most, the, one of the best jobs in the world. You can do whatever you want and you can really change the world. Um, and I think that's something that, that we very, also in the CMI, we, we see that the kind of multilateral solutions and more and more we work in teams uh, as we are promoting peace. But enough of that. Uh, we, I think we go into details uh, as, as, we, as the discussion goes forward. Thank you. Great. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jana. Now, Mirko, um, uh, we all thought about 25, 26 years ago, that Mozambique had reached a lasting peace. Uh, a great Italian uh, man uh, helped the parties in Mozambique uh, come together in Rome, actually in a Catholic lay community, if I remember, San Egidio. And we thought peace was breaking out in Mozambique and we all rejoiced. And it seemed to be doing very well as a country for the next 10 years, perhaps even a bit more. But more recently, the country has become more troubled. And I suspect your appointment by the Secretary General has something to do with that. Uh, it's been a low-key business, but clearly he invests huge confidence in you. So perhaps you can tell us a bit about your mission and how you go about it, uh, which must be mysterious to many of us in the room. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you to Phil and to organize this, uh, this event. You said right that Mozambique was uh, going so well, but maybe they didn't want so badly peace. <laughs> and uh, my job today is exactly that one, is uh, trying to give voice to the people that they want badly peace. Uh, we, uh, we were facing a lot of challenges. Uh, Mozambique, I would say, is, is strongly today really, and I would say is really badly uh, looking for peace. And uh, we, we, with my team, we were challenged by many, many uh, different problems, but we always, uh, uh, got the full support of Mozambique and of every, I mean, at every level, I would say. In the last year, as you could see, Mozambique uh, was uh, facing different problems from uh, economic uh, side, from peace, from, from the problem in the north. But today, I think, uh, is, is, uh, is really uh, the fact of really wanted, that the fact that they want really badly this peace is making probably Mozambique successful and a successful example. Uh, my job is, is uh, building bridges, building bridges between the parties, uh, trying to make possible that every solution is shared and uh, that we come to a win-win uh, situation. I think that uh, one of the, of the key of the success probably of the work we are doing is the fact that we were capable, or we were, thank you to, to, to the Secretary General, I hope he's right to trust me, <laughs> I hope at least. <laughs> Uh, it was the fact of giving continuity to the fact that, for instance, I, as you said, I've been ambassador for uh, five years in Mozambique, 
uh, we negotiate for three years, more or less, the, the, the agreement, and then we commit with that, and we could go ahead in implementing the agreement with the same team. This, I think, is, is, was one of the, of the important uh, key uh, elements that will probably bring Mozambique to the final, I would say, peace, if, if, if it's like that. But it's true, we need, uh, and we, it is true that uh, you, you need to really want peace badly to, to succeed. It's not just a matter of being a good mediator or a good news. You, you need to be there at the right moment. Mm. Great. Well, thank you very much for that. I hope you've all been thinking about your questions for <laughs> our four guests. Uh, also, that those who are following us online may be beginning to formulate questions they want to ask. Uh, their website is being monitored and uh, we'll be able to go to a couple of them. I forgot to introduce myself at the outset, mainly because I'm the least interesting person on the panel, but my background is as a very bad student, so I started work at the age of 20, and it was work that made me curious, and I started going back to school because I knew there were things I couldn't learn at work that a school I could perhaps learn from. Uh, and I worked in uh, diplomacy, uh, in the uh, NGO world, in the think tank world, uh, and now in a UN organization quite late in life. And I think, uh, actually, in one respect, my career is typical of what younger people will be experiencing. I think many of you will do many things in your lives rather than have mm -hmm. one linear career. In fact, none of us have had one linear career. <laughs> and that's very exciting because it's not because you're engaged in something you're enjoying mm -hmm. that you're going to go on enjoying it forever mm -hmm. and trying out other things might be fun. Now, I'm opening the floor. Might any of you with questions please put up your hand? My colleagues with microphones will be looking for you. Uh, and those online, please enter your questions uh, on the site uh, and they'll be monitored. So who is going to be the brave first person to ask a question? And you can direct your question to any member of the panel uh, or to the panel in its entirety. So please, I see a question over there. Uh, could you keep your hand up? Otherwise, the microphone won't find you. <laughs> and please introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, my name is Benjamin Pedrini. I'm from the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Uh, based in Washington, D.C. I have a question for the panel and maybe for Severin um, primary, but I, I would be keen to hear from others. Um, your approach and your point about the local level and the grassroots initiatives, how do you then bridge that level, which is obviously needed and necessary and very important with the more um, higher level of a political settlement in a country, for example, the role um, that the UN Special Envoy plays in, in, in Mozambique. Thank you very much. Great. So, uh, Severine, will you pick up first on, on the question? Absolutely. Thank you so much for asking that question because that's one of the most difficult uh, questions at the heart of my research and, and that's where I think we need a lot more research. Uh, I, what I've seen uh, when I was studying grassroots peace building is that uh, it's really, really hard, as we all know, to, uh, to move from the grassroots to, to the higher level. And uh, the best example of success that uh, I found is Somaliland. Uh, Somaliland, which is a fascinating place of the world. I could spend like five hours talking about Somaliland, uh, but it's, it's the best case I've found of grassroots efforts actually making a difference on a very large territory with a significant population. So given that we're in Finland, 
Uganda, I looked up the stats and uh, everybody tells me, oh, Somaliland, I mean, first people don't know where it is most of the time, so it's uh, this, uh, this autonomous region in the north of Somalia, uh, in the Horn of Africa. And it's a territory that's as large, like larger than Finland. It's uh, 130,000, uh, 37,000 kilometer. And it has a population of 4 million people. And they've really managed to build peace but from the ground up by uh, working with insiders, by following their own customs and their own beliefs. Um, and, uh, and they've organized uh, peace conferences uh, for, the, for, for, for 20 years. They've organized peace conferences, but that were are really led by local leaders that were supported by ordinary people, by the diaspora, and they've built a state and they've built a functioning democracy. Uh, and they've done that, again, by relying on their own customs and beliefs and timetable. And there was outside support, but outside support on Somaliland's term, because Somaliland has never been recognized as an independent country yet, apart from two, uh, two places, two countries that have recognized it. And so to me, what, what it teaches us about how, how, to, how to connect uh, grassroots to, to higher, uh, higher level efforts is that it really has to be case specific. And so I'm, I know I, I sound very much like an academic when I tell you, oh, well, it depends, uh, <laughs> but it does. <laughs> and, and I've looked, uh, I, I've, I've really uh, looked at all of the grassroots efforts and all of the successful efforts, not only in, uh, in African countries like Somaliland, uh, like uh, like Congo, etc. But I've also looked uh, at at. Uh, initiatives that make a difference in the United States, in France, in other parts of the world. And every time I saw that there was no pattern, uh, that there was no uh, template that I could give you, uh, but that there were only a series of big principles or big commonalities that were that all of the efforts, the successful efforts, were led by insiders. So they were led by ordinary people and uh, by people like Dr. Spey who really, really badly wanted peace uh, and who managed to rise up. Uh, so led by ordinary people, sometimes supported by foreigners, but again, foreigners who stay in the background, who support local efforts and definitely don't try to lead them. And, uh, and efforts that, uh, that were usually very long time. Uh, we have to realize that, as someone told me in, in, in Colombia, you know, peace building is not instant coffee. Uh, it's not the kind of thing that, yay, in two years it's going to happen. Uh, peace building is really something that you have to work on on an everyday basis and maintain for 20 years. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to stop because Great. I've been talking Great, Sivrin, and I think each of the panel members would have something to say. Spee, why don't you kick off? You know... Peace building is not romantic. Conflict resolution is romantic. Because you are talking to people who are at the top or who carry a gun. Whereas peace building, like Severin says, is really with the ordinary people. Mm. And I want to say that uh, you talk about Somaliland and that beautiful village in DRC in your book. Please get hold of this book and give her some money for it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. She has given me a free copy, <laughs> but you have to buy it. <laughs> now, you know, sometimes we have very short memories and also because of the, the new technology. I'll go back to my country, Uganda. And I can talk to issues in Burundi, where I spent a whole year examining what was wrong with our region. I spent 2015 in Burundi. Now, in Uganda, people know about the current times. We really had terrible, terrible situation. We had changed presidents I don't know how many times. And when the, the government of Museveni, whom you've all heard about, came, I belong to the Democratic Party. We had the Uganda People's Congress. We had the, the King's Party. And we had the ordinary people. I'm coming to think 
that these are also, parties are also like tribes of same-minded thinking, which is nepotism of the highest order. The ordinary people actually don't belong to any party. And we think multi-party democracy is democracy. In Uganda, we came together. I was a young woman of 20, in my early 20s, just started my family, and I joined the Democratic Party. The war continued after multi-party elections. If you see the apartment where I was living, you see gunshot wounds. So I feel it when I see cities where people's homes have been shot, because I have lived it. Now, having been a multi-party activist and a woman leader from a very early age, and this government came in and said, we are not going to go multi-party, we want every village to elect the people they think, think for them, are a part of them. So they elected us. I personally was doing my master's degree in surgery. I went back to my village. They had put my name on a piece of paper on a stick and lined up behind me to be part of the village leadership. So we went up like that. It was not possible to become a member of parliament if you had not been elected by your village. Those are the people who know you. And we agreed that no parties Individual merit, come and speak for your people. That's the time when our parliament was most dynamic, when it wasn't asking for raises in salaries, and where ministers were not paid an allowance for their constituency. I want to tell you, when we went multi-party now, the parliament is the most corrupt. The parliament earns salaries higher than even the, the, big, the, the chief justice, and uh, you know, so the democracy, what is that democracy which speaks to the village, the small person? How do you bridge that? How do you bridge that? I think we need to go back to that villager, the person. How do you support that? Support education. Because if I'm in my village, that National Resistance Council, which I belong to, we didn't have illiterate people. They elected Speciosa, who was doing surgery. She knows us inside out, you know? She knows us inside, and she feels for that. And she was a student activist. The youth, elected youth, whom were working and active in the village. But now, you need to be in the bush selling marijuana, you are part of Boko Haram, and they are negotiating for you, with you. you your business is to, to traffic people, they are negotiating for, but the people, I was in the Gambia last month, and the people in the villages are just keen to go about their business. But who cares about them? Now, that's why I love CMI. <laughs> <laughs> because when we tell them, we bring, we shall talk about that, I think, later. So how do you bridge that? We get researchers like her. They go in. Yeah? Find out what are the people talking about in an objective manner. Don't get politicians or even NGOs in the villages. They are just small business people with their small business getting, but researchers, that's why I'm advocating for researchers to get involved at every level because they have been trained to be objective. Then we shall move up. I think that's why I'm, I have fallen in love with you. <laughs> right. Yes. Mirko, please. I just would, would like to say yes. building peace is, is true, is, is um, how to say, you said it is, uh, uh, you said that the building peace, no, no, not is emotional, you say something else, sorry. Not romantic. Not yes, it's not, it's not it is romantic. right, it's not romantic, but building <laughs> peace, I think, is, is quite emotional at the end of the way. In bringing uh, the, grass, the voice of the grassroots <laughs> to the table, it means also going to the bush and listening to the people. Mm -hmm. You don't build, we didn't build the peace in Mozambique by staying in a five-star hotel. 
we went to the bush, we talked to the people, and we understood that these people, they wanted badly peace, as you say. This is right. We went many times, we came back. We were, I mean, at the end, we found many times that fighting would have been easier sometimes to sort it out. Making peace was difficult, was more difficult. We spent time, it was long. It was very long. It was long, but when you see, you go to the bush, you see people suffering, you see people struggling, you see how war is destroying, you come back and you fight. Mm. You fight for peace, because yes. you, you'd have to take out your shoes and, and put boots, yes. and yes. then yes. run, mm -hmm. and then go and see how people they are suffering really in front of the daily problem they have just to get food, because everything is destroyed, everything is broken. Mm. So when you see that and you don't stay in your hotel, you will fight for peace. Right. You really fight. Great. Mm. Jana? I have a two-part answer for how to get the local people involved. The first is, uh, is the kind of conference room answer. The, the other one is a practical answer. I think starting with the conference room uh, answer, if you look at the CMI, CMI strategy, we made the new strategy uh, last year, and we aim for three things. First, we support peace processes, informal and formal. Second, we support agency of local actors, and third, we support kind of solutions or methodological solutions. And number two is the local part. This is something of after 20 years we have realized that this is clearly an area that we have to work more, build local agency. That in a kind of conceptual terms, that is what is required. Support the local actors that want the peace. That, and that, that's something that, that is clearly what, what, is what is needed more and more. And we just came out a year ago to say that, in the practical terms. Uh, as the CEO of organized, peace building organization, I see some of my colleagues here that are working on a practical projects. When I meet my people, uh, project officers, project managers, I tell them, I am not building peace, you are building peace. The, all the solutions, that come, don't expect me to tell them what to do. Mm -hmm. You have to listen to local people. You have to be there in the bush to get the sense what needs to be done. They have to have the ideas. They have to get to know the people. And this is really, that's kind of very practical point. And I ask my people really that I can ask me, ask more resources for me, something like that, but really, the peace building issues, the peace building, the really important decisions, they are happening at the very low level. And I think that's, I push them that, don't look at, bring me ideas, bring me the people I need to meet, we need to work together, uh, forward. And I, what I said for them, kind of, in a very practical terms, one thing that you keep in mind, don't take your problems in these processes. Start from the problems of the local people. Mm -hmm. That's the capacity building that if you are in Afghanistan, don't start to resolve your own problems in Afghanistan. Try to resolve the problems of Afghan people. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we got wrong. <laughs> we, we were so wound up with our own issues that we did not see the problems that the people had. But these are the very practical points that I give to my people that go and try to build peace. Mm. Great. Mm. Now, who would like to intervene next? I see several hands up in the back. Could we first go to the gentleman who's seated? Uh, there. Keep your hand up if you want to speak. Good. Yeah, <clears throat> my name is... Yeah, <clears throat> my name is Daryl Sequera. I'm an environmental ecologist. And I have a question for the gentleman concerned with Mozambique. Uh, sorry, was it um, Manzoni? Mirko. <laughs> um, we all know that in the um, uh, north of Mozambique, they have a huge um, gas and probably oil uh, field, which is being financed by Total Oil Company, the French company. And um, the people at the moment living in that area are mostly below the poverty line. Uh, recently, it was announced that the Total Company has given the government of Mozambique 350 million, I, th I suppose, euros. For what it wasn't said. Mm -hmm. 
Now, with your knowledge and uh, connection with Mozambique, I would like to ask you, um, how much of that would be spent on bringing about peace in Mozambique and bettering the uh, life um, situation of the people who live in the area where their resources are possibly going to make Mozambique extremely rich? Who will take that money? Total or Mozambique? or someone else. My second question goes to the lady from Uganda. Uh, thank you for a very entertaining presentation. Um, the question that emerges in my mind is when I hear that, oh, you're from Uganda, the first thing is, oh yeah, Idi Amin, right? And surely he wasn't a man of peace, in my opinion anyway. Um, now, it's a long time has gone by, and today we can ask, concerning, considering the history of Uganda since Idi Amin, today we can ask how different is Uganda today in view of peace, in view of integration of minorities and so on, to the current question that we are facing today. Thank you. Good. Now, a number of people want to intervene, but these are interesting questions. So if each of you, uh, Mirko and Spe, could be quite brief in answering, we can get to more uh, questions. So, I, Mirko, I will, please. I will uh, be relatively brief. First, the problem in, in the north of, of Mozambique, it's not just due to gas and oil. Uh, in a sense, uh, you know, uh, poverty in Mozambique is, is also in Nyasa, is also in Gaza, in, in, in different uh, provinces, and Mozambique is one of the poorest countries in, 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 in Africa anyway. So it's not just because of oil and gas. But then sometimes, you know, I just would like to, to, to be clear, uh, we will benefit much more from oil and gas than Mozambique. So the question should be asked, we have to ask Total to be responsible first. First, in, in helping Mozambique in doing, in, in using in, in the best way. But it's not only Total. Any, any industry exploiting resources could be any, could be Total, could be Exxon, could be any, and could be Glencore. This is a much important, you know, we are the first benefiting from that. So let's ask them to be more, I mean, to be responsible in that sense, I would say. Great. Spey, over to you. What I can say is that uh, too much peace can also bring problems. <laughs> <laughs> yes, people, again, like I said, they go to sleep. Now, what happened from when Idi Amin was uh, thrown out and we got changes in between of re-educating ourselves? What we have gotten is now multi-party democracy, which has ended up in two-party oligarchy and again complacence by my generation. What I can tell you is that we are back to the time of Idi Amin, where young people are now coming up to say, we want this. So I think what I see being positive in my country is because some of us who continue to want peace badly, <coughs> we see a new generation which is continuing to want peace badly. I think that is the positive thing one can say about this, because human beings are human beings. You will always have people wanting to exploit others. But if you can keep that culture alive through this kind of interactions and research and getting people to speak within the decorum of knowing what is within the law and changing those laws to conform to what is appropriate at the time, I think is what is wonderful. So certainly Uganda is much better off. Whether it is at its best is also now raising the question is what would be its best, and that is what we are working towards. Great, thank you very much. There was another question at the back. Uh, there is a lady here at the front, then we'll go to, please. And then we will go and see if online we have some questions. So uh, please, sir, go ahead. Good morning. Hello. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Salam Al-Ubaidi. 
I'm from Al Mayadeen Pan Arabic uh, Media Network. Uh, and I want to focus in my question on the situation in Ukraine. I mean, uh, we deal now with a new sort of conflict in Europe. Maybe it's different from other con conflicts. It is a conflict in which uh, involved superpowers with nuclear weapons. Don't you think it is very dangerous for the peace for us uh, when we have uh, such a conflict and when uh, uh, we isolate Russia? Uh, don't you afraid that this will uh, maybe uh, get us to a nuclear uh, war? Thank you very much. Good, thank you. So the, the question is, is isolating Russia a good strategy and could it lead to nuclear war? Uh, any of the panel members wish to address that? I think those who are close to Europe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I will also have my say on that one after I listen to them. <laughs> Okay, Jana and Mir <laughs> Mirko, perhaps. Uh, Jana first uh, and then Mirko. I would use the same word of the Secretary General in saying that this war must stop. Because, first of all, I don't believe that isolating one of the party will be the solution for sure. But, uh, uh, and as I said, like it was in, in Mozambique, most of time, uh, even if dialogue should prevail and dialogue will be the solution, it is the most difficult step. It is where it is difficult really to, but it is, this is what we have to, to work for at the end of the day. I don't have the feeling that today we are working too much for dialogue mm -hmm. in that conflict, in that specific mm -hmm. conflict. And I think this is, is, uh, is really where we have to make much more effort. Fighting is sometimes, I would say, easier. Mm. Jana? Th thank you. I've been asked about Ukraine many times. We all hope for peace. We all hope for a process and negotiations. Negotiations and peace negotiations require two things. They require will of the po both sides. And I think this is, you have to want the peace. This is what I'm not sure yet. I think the parties might not be willing to engage. Uh, they th still see a military option as the way forward. And that's very difficult to, to do anything in that situation. Uh, when we start to see that the parties are willing to engage in negotiations, then it's about trust. We have to start to build the trust with the par between the parties. And this is something that it's not a huge, it, is, it starts from the small practical things of evacuations, of, uh, of uh, humanitarian corridors, small things that parties start to negotiate and start to deal with each other and start to trust that I can trust that if we have a corridor here, they won't be shelling. But we are not there either. So the two things what we, what we need to, to somehow build is to support the parties to get willing to get engaged and then to increase some sort of trust. And that is a very short supply if you look what is happening right now. So I am quite pessimistic of the field about the peace, a peace process right now, but it will happen. As I said, every conflict can be resolved. And we still believe that, even if this is a very difficult one. Uh, if I may, yeah. I'll, I'll have something to yeah. say, but uh, uh, then Spey will have the last word on this one, unless Severine also wants to speak yes. on it. Uh, I think the, uh, one of the very big problems raised by this absolutely senseless war is it is diverting a lot of money from the development of developing countries. Uh, that's obscured in the Western media, which is extremely excited about the conflict. But actually, the, amongst the victims of this conflict will be many people in the developing world who will not receive the support they deserve to receive. So focusing only on Ukraine or Russia or Europe is a big mistake because the rest of the world is affected whether they're actively involved or not. So over to you, uh, Spe, and then Sébrine will have the last word. I have very little to say, but let me say this. 
in my short experience, and I'm 67 years old. That is quite short. A mere youngster compared to me. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you look at what's happening in Africa, and you look at what's happening now, unfortunately, in Ukraine, mm -hmm. one sees that at the end of the day, there is no developing or developed country. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when I look at the issue of the question raised by the brother on the resources in the northern part of Mozambique, I, I have not addressed myself wholly to Ukraine, but having been a geography student and wanting to be a chemical engineer at one time, I know that Ukraine is no different from DRC, is no different from uh, Mozambique. So at the end of the day, it's really about resources. And the ordinary person has not been educated as to what the real cause of war is when the big powers come in to show their might. It's about resources. And it goes down to what uh, my brother's uh, CMI is all about saying, empower the women. And as a medical doctor, I say, it's about testosterone at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And this is why I say that countries being led by less testosterone should not get near this. <laughs> because we need a reference point for us to even in research say, Countries led by less testosterone or women opposed to those ones, what, was, what is their reaction and response in issues of conflict like this? So I know that part of what is in, in, Af in the African Union, we started FEMWISE. And because we've been so keen on peace and security in Africa and the world and linking up with our sisters in Europe and uh, Asia, and uh, Southern America and America, we have said, let's address ourselves to the real issues bringing no peace and looking at these pockets of no peace in Africa. How are they related to the issue of resources? And there's a very big association which you can even say one causes the other. So I think in these meetings, we should also seriously look at the issue of resources underground resources which nobody has actually put under there for us to really say, why have you hit Libya when the African Union was keen to have that problem solved? Why are you so much in DRC? Why is France there? Why is Russia going there? Yet the African Union is in a position to solve those problems. So at the end of the day, it will also help us to determine the levels of international engagement for real peace where we can have proper coexistence. That is my small observation. Terrific, Stay. Many thanks, Segrin, <laughs> please. Thank you so much, and thank you for the question. Um, okay, I was told you're the academic voice on this panel, so as a good academic, I'm going to question the question, because that's what we do. Um, and okay, you asked, okay, is isolating Russia uh, the, good, the good way to go? Are we going to go toward a nuclear war? And to me, it, and you said, well, this is, you know, new, uh, a new thing. But to me, it sounds very old. It sounds like the very approach that we've been going, uh, that we've been using all the time. It's uh, negotiation with elites. It's trying to resolve things at a state level, as an elite level, working with governments, etc. And you're asking, is that, you know, is that going to work? Of course not. It's not going to work. And we've seen that over and over and over again. And um, last year, I was uh, talking with a Ukrainian grassroots activists. They invited me to present uh, the new book, The Frontlines of Peace. And we had a discussion for, for two hours around like, the, the idea of top-down versus bottom-up peace building and, and why elite level. You, you know that the war in Ukraine has been going on for, for many years. And uh, they were telling me, oh, you know, what, what you're saying about top-down peace building and the fact that people ignore uh, bottom-up 
grassroots actors and ignore the work with ordinary people and don't put ordinary people in the driver's seat, it feels very relevant to what, we're going, what, what is going on in Ukraine. And uh, my host, she's a grassroots, uh, she's a grassroots activist still, um, and, and she said, you know, uh, in 2014, uh, when you remember the, the whole conflict actually started, she said in 2014, when, when the whole thing blew up, it felt like the whole world descended on us. Uh, and everybody was coming to Ukraine and telling us, oh, we're going to help you, we're going to help you, we're going to build peace. And she said, we, we have currently, I mean, that was last year, I think the number has gone up, but she said in t last year they had 2,000 international non governmental diplomatic organizations in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And she said, everybody is coming and they're all saying, yes, put local actors in the driver's seat, local ownership, local mm -hmm. people, blah, 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 <laughs> blah. She said, everybody's talking the talk, yes. but nobody's walking the walk. Right. Out of the 2,000 organizations that she could see in Ukraine, only two of them were actually walking the walk, meaning supporting grassroots actors, staying behind, not putting, not resolving their own problems and not putting their own priorities, but actually listening and doing what people tell them. If they tell them we want education, then helping provide education. If they tell them, please get out and don't talk to me ever again, then getting out and not talking to them ever again. So to me, the problem in, is Ukraine, in Ukraine right now is something that has been building up and that has been building up because we've used the field, what I call Peace Inc., Peace Incorporated, the field approach that we constantly use to try to resolve conflict. And of course, it doesn't work. And of course, it blew up. And now we're, we're seeing what we're seeing in Ukraine. Great. Uh, let's move to the question here, and then we'll find out about uh, what's been going on online. Um, my name is Grazia Pacillo, uh, I'm from CGIR, um, CGIR Focus Climate Security, and my question actually follows what Dr. Spey was, was, was referring to, the natural resources, and in particular the relations between climate, climate crisis, natural resources, and peace and security. Um, we've all seen that the IPCC report... Could you slow down a bit, <laughs> perhaps? <laughs> it's very difficult right, to yeah. Sorry. Uh, internalize all of this. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so the, the latest, one of the latest IPCC report has clearly pointed out that the link between climate and peace and security exists, albeit uh, being uh, indirect, complex and non-linear. So uh, I wanted to pick your brain on the role that climate and the climate crisis is having on peace and security across the globe. And also, um, I wanted to understand whether you have any idea uh, in terms of how do we make peace building and peacekeeping operations more sensitive to the climate crisis and vice versa. How do we make our climate action more sensitive to the root causes of conflict? Thank you. Great. Uh, which members of the panel would like to respond? It's uh, a question essentially about climate and conflict and relates also to food, uh, uh, mm. which is the bread and butter of CGIAR. Mm. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead, Mirko? I, I think uh, I, I spend some time in, in different places of conflict and uh, sometimes in Africa, and I think it's, it is true. Unfortunately, it is again linked to resources. The, the future conflicts, they will be linked to, to, to food security, to water, to, to this kind of, of problem that they are, of course, linked to, to the climate change. But uh, we, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm speaking that way, maybe I will not have so many friends, but we from the Western side, sometimes we are a bit far. We just look at our perspective and we don't, therefore I'm saying ask Total first instead of asking Mozambique what they would like to do. So uh, exploiting resources need to take on board the perspective of the country where the resources are first, of course. And uh, I think it, is, it will be key to, to combine climate change and the use of resources. But what is important is to establish a partnership with these countries, not just going, exploiting, and leaving. We experienced this a bit in Mozambique, and I have to be honest, Mozambique, just to, to answer again to the question that was asked, Mozambique made effort to impose his view 
But when you impose your view, sometimes you, have, you are left a bit aside. Yes. So they stop the projects <laughs> because they can exploit somewhere else. Instead of establishing a sound partnership and saying, okay, fine, let's sit and, and look at the problem seriously. Let's look at what, how the community they will benefit, how we can do it better. We just look at our perspective, we need oil and gas. And then we left. That's is, is a, we need to establish a serious partnership of, of, with, with these countries. Great. Anybody else on the panel? Jana? Thanks. Um, I'll, I'll start. And this, this is a guesswork. We are, we're, we are entering a new world in many ways. My take on the actual conflicts, how the conflicts evolve, and I'm dealing with the conflicts, they might not be that much influenced by uh, the climate change. I would argue that they might be more the actual, what is the conflict dynamics? They would be more influenced by geopolitics and technology, but we can get into that. That the, the actual how the conflict plays out, but then where do they happen? How they intensify? What are the issues? What are the triggers? It lowers the triggers, it brings it in new areas, it brings new people into the conflicts. So this is all what the climate change, it, it just kind of, it upends maybe not the kind of the core dynamics of, of, of the conflict, as, as it seems to me right now, but really everything else around it, who are the people, where and how, and, 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 and the kind of the, the speed and so forth. But that would be my kind of short answer to your extremely pertinent and difficult question. Thanks. Please, Spain. Just to, to say that I was in the Central African Republic, and when I you read in the media, they will tell you Muslims are killing Christians and Christians are killing Muslims. And when we went there, the real issue is exactly what you are talking about. The people there, they, 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 some are Muslims, some are Christians, the, wife, the daughter is married to a Muslim. It, it, it's, but internationally, there is a fad as Christians, versus Muslims, uh, but the real issue is livelihoods. And yes, other players come in to feed into that, but the people know exactly what the problem is. Because you see the, the cardinal of the Christians and the, 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 the Kadi and all these religious leaders telling you, we have no problem. Our people are not killing each other. They've been living like this for years, but the desert is coming down. And the cows are eating. The, the, it, it, you may even kill each other, whether you are both Christians, because your maize has been eaten consistently and the desert is coming down. Now, who will stop this? It's the local people being supported to do that. How do you encourage them to modernize the way they do things and to get better from what they have or to change their means of livelihood. So at the end of the day, we go back to involving the local people. And a lot of these issues, they get inter internationalized with the international agendas for specific issues that they can link to what is happening in that country or in that region to divert the attention of people from what it is that they want to do. Uh, if I may add, uh, about 55 years ago in a country my parents took me to, Nigeria, there was a, a, a very murderous civil war, and the whole strategy of the federal government of Nigeria was to isolate the rebel region and essentially starve it. It was highly effective actually. And uh, this is something that hangs over us uh, still. People don't remember that conflict. It was hugely murderous. And by the way, the, the punchline of the conflict was the leader who had started the rebellion led his people to disaster, helicoptered out at the last minute, and led a rich life in Abidjan. Uh, in Côte d'Ivoire until Nigeria actually allowed him to return home where he died. So, but many of his tribal kinspeople were not so lucky. So uh, starvation as a strategy of war isn't new. It's actually quite recent and uh, uh, it's a terrible thing 
when it occurs. Now, I, I understand we have some uh, questions online, so please uh, go ahead with at least one. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, so we have received quite a lot of comments and, and questions in the uh, online chat, so just picking one. So, uh, Hani Almegari asks, um, how can we rebuild or uh, regain trust in the global peace building processes? as we have seen uh, many mistakes in the past and uh, double standards which have uh, contributed to, to many conflicts and, and social unrest. Hmm. Uh, Severine, perhaps? <laughs> Thank you. I, I think that's a fantastic question. And, and that's one of the questions that motivated uh, my, my latest research because, uh, like, frankly, when you work on, on war and peace, it's absolutely depressing, not only to see, you know, all of the horrible things that happen in war, but also seeing all of, as, as Hani uh, was saying, all of the double standards and, and all of the failed efforts. And the way I regain peace in... Uh, in uh, I begin, sorry, it's 1, 1 a.m. in the morning according to my biological <laughs> clock and so my, <laughs> my body and, and mind are um, not there. Uh, so the way I re regain trust in, in peace building is by uh, seeing what I call the, the model peace builders, uh, people who really inspire me and whom I've met all over the world, uh, working for all kinds of different organizations, or working at the village level, or working uh, you know, in cities, in, in, in rural areas, etc. People who do things differently. People who have found a new way to actually decrease violence. And they don't necessarily call themselves peace builders. Sometimes they call themselves grassroots activists, or community organizers, or different things. But uh, to me, they have, they have a few things in common. Uh, and the first and the most important things is that they don't think that they know better, uh, that they have the, uh, the best theories, the most relevant skills, uh, that they bring the answer to people's problems, but instead there are people who listen, uh, who are humble, and, and who understand that other people have a different understanding of peace, democracy, development, different priorities. Um, and uh, they're also there for the long run. So, for example, like Miko, they, they stay on site for years, uh, sometimes decades, sometimes their whole life. Uh, they, um, can I continue? Please. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They, they don't place themselves at the forefront of peace efforts. And, and when they are not, you know, when they work for an organization, they don't put their logos everywhere. They don't do branding and visibility. But instead, uh, uh, they take the back, the back seat and they turn the spotlight on the efforts of ordinary people, uh, on the other local activists, on uh, grassroots members of the community. And the last thing that's really, really important is that, and it's really sad, it's that they understand that not all good things come together. Um, so, for example, uh, peace and democracy sometimes conflict, and peace and justice sometimes conflict, and, and we cannot have it all together. We cannot promote peace and democracy and development and thinking that everything is going to work out in two years. Uh, but rather, uh, they know that sometimes there are hard choices to be made, because sometimes we have to choose between peace and justice or peace and democracy. And, and the, best, uh, the best peace builders I've seen, uh, they understand that they are not the ones who should make the decision. But the people who should decide are the people who are going to live with the, with the consequences of that decision. Great. Anyone else? Mirko, please. Uh, I think that how to make possible or to regain trust in building peace, because today we have to be honest, there is a lot of processes that they are failing, is really to educate our people and to become critical, to challenge politicians. Because what is missing sometimes is just basic values. To be honest, mm -hmm. just be honest. And, and, and don't, you know, we speak about propaganda, we all have our propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> we all have our propaganda. You know, when I was very discreet when, when, when there was this vote at the assembly of, of, the, of the United Nations, but I can understand the, the Africa position sometimes. Eh? Having worked a while there, I feel that, that they have a voice and they start now to speak, finally, to speak out. We need to be honest. And then we can bring back trust in our work. But we need really to be honest. 
is a difficult exercise. Great. Jana? Uh, thanks. There have been excellent answers how to rebuild. And I, I'll add one aspect, and my point is that uh, the peace building is a team sport, not any more individual sport. Mm -hmm. I think that's a fundamental issue that kind of the rules of the games have, uh, game have changed. So this is that we have to realize this is a team sport. And different players have key roles and important roles. International organizations really need to up their game. And too much sport metaphors. They, uh, they really need to, to really work harder. And, and clearly, they are in the many ways linchpins that the certain strategic choices they might not, the kind of international organizations need to be able to make them. The last uh, 10, 15, 20 years, we have seen the lack of capability of really taking charge of certain issues, really at the strategic level. And that's something that we are lacking. I see the independent actors that, that I represent is somewhere we are filling in the holes. We are acting in concert with, with, with kind of international actors. And we, we try to bring what we can do uh, bottom up, uh, looking at the inclusive piece and all that. But clearly, if we lack that overarching sense of what, what we are doing, where we are going, it is the, the problems that we have seen at the UN, the problems we have seen in AU, the problems we have seen in OSC. I, I can continue forever. These are really that something that is hamstrung. And what I see as an independent actor, we, ha we had a record, year, a record level of requests for us, the CMI, to involve. Uh, this is something when the international kind of organizations are not capable of doing their kind of strategic level work, then the owners, we are asked to do more. And that's something, we can do something, but not everything. But I, I think my point is really peace building as a team sport, and we have to all know what is what we are required to do. And I see especially international organizations lacking for the geopolitical reasons, uh, kind of not being able to provide the leadership we would, we would need. Great. Spain? I agree with my colleagues. But I want to go back to my grassroots professional area, and that is medicine. And I want to say COVID has taught us a lot. I've been part of the COVID strategic committee for my country as a presidential advisor on, on health and population issues. So I poke my head in every sector because health is everything. And uh, what happened in the beginning is that ministries of health, which I call ministries of diseases, were really focused on the medical epidemiology as if something new was actually on the table. But medical epidemiology, there is nothing new. The masks were there way back in the 19th century, washing hands, social distancing. So I said, you know, the variable here is the human being. And the fact that they are the ones who change depending on where you place them. And then they, they began to wake up and say, let us involve local government. Let us involve the, the village chiefs. Let, so at the end of the day, after COVID, the multi-sectoral and international arena has been opened up for every sector, which leads to peace or whatever you want to talk about. So we involve Rotarians. Now you have Rotarians for peace. You have architects for peace, things to do with the climate change. The engineers are organized globally. Architects are organized globally. Now, what we have to do is to actually get the peace experts work side in side. And these are the silos that I was talking about. Yes, we work as silos within the peace arena, but we work as silos, as if the space we want to occupy is actually empty. So at the end of it all, I believe we can achieve much more within the shortest time. I'll take you to my small country, Uganda. I keep telling people that even with matters of village interventions, you have the growth rate of people 60 and above. In our last census, eh, we had moved from 
population of my age group from being less than 6% to 10%. And where are we? We are back in the villages. And we are educated. We have seen so much of this nonsense. We don't want to die and not go to heaven. <laughs> How do you use that population? Look at the literacy rate. Look at the professional areas. How many engineers do you have in each locality? So there is so much we can do to get a new architecture for peace building across the world. Because we tend to professionalize and say, I'm professional here, I'm professional here. I agree with you, I am a jack of all trades. You know, and that's why I said I get bored. So let us all get bored with what we are doing and also work with other people and see how we can improve the way we work. <coughs> Great. Uh, now, another question online. And could you please let us know who is asking <coughs> the question, if you can say that? Uh, yes. Let's just... Um, yes, so there's a question from uh, Sartak Gupta asking about how artificial intelligence can be instrumental to combat uh, peace-building challenges and develop decision support systems for designing policy solutions. Thank you. Aha. Uh, Jana, you've probably dealt with this. <laughs> Thank you. An excellent question. This is what we, are, what we are grappling. What we know for sure is that next 10 years, the peace building sector will be upended. It, it, there will be kind of changes that will be created by technology. I think we know, we are sure of that. We are not sure what would be the changes, how that will play out. And I think artificial intel intelligence is one aspect. And uh, before I get into that, and I think what I am being very disappointed is that the peace building folks, the peace building industry, Peace Corp, uh, has been late on picking up on technology. It's actually adversaries, the kind of the war corp, has been much more effective and they have actually been able to really harness the technology much, much more than the, this side of the uh, kind of, the, 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 uh, the kind of, the dark side has been more eff effective on the kind of, and harnessing the technology. That's something, these are the facts that we know. Uh, so we have to, we have to be better in, kind of getting ideas what we can do. Artificial in 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 intelligence and, and really the, uh, the kind of the huge pools of data that we can have. There have been some work. It has been a very slow process. There has been a kind of early, early warning issues. There have been some sort of uh, kind of, uh, which, which has been kind of relatively successful. I think the UN Global Pulse has been one that has been working on these issues. But we are not as good as we should be. And I think my kind of uh, answer is, is not trying to be better that we are really admitting that we are not where we should be. We are in the CMI thinking how this technology could be more harnessed. We are not at the artificial intelligence level yet, to be honest. We are really looking for the communication uh, that really, I think one of the for me, the low-hanging fruits of the use of technology is more a digital inclusion. I would, like to, I would like to see the artificial intelligence applied for the conflict resolution, but what I see would be more doable in the next few years is digital inclusion. Millions of world's people could actually be meaningfully engaged politically through digital means. That's what I mean with the digital inclusion. I think that would be... Not, not saying that we shouldn't do artificial intelligence, but I think this is where we try to focus on the CMR right now. Really, how in the practical terms we can, we can do, and also bring some ideas uh, together with the, uh, with, the, um, with the kind of technological community. And I think my, my for, final point is that what we need more, I've been lamenting that we are bad, uh, the one thing what we need more in the peace uh, sector, in this peace building, is contacts with the private sector because that's where the technology is developed. Uh, we have been quite active pushing and trying to find new uh, technologies because we are not going to turn a technology company. We could adopt and get ideas from the company. So I think one point we, we try to do is really reach out to the private sector. And for example, Finland, we have a very, very vibrant ecosystem 
of tech companies, and we have established partnerships, and we are talking with several of them, looking for the technologies that we could use in, in our piece work. Thanks. If, if I can uh, add from a different angle completely, because, Jan, I'm no expert, and it's great <laughs> to hear you're on top of this. Uh, my experience of negotiation, and I used to chair negotiations at the UN, is that ultimately it's a very human business. So we will be helped by artificial uh, intelligence, but there's a very high emotional content in negotiation that uh, I think artificial intelligence will be hard pressed to, um, how can I say, uh, master, so to speak. Uh, so I think it's full of promise, yeah. but I think the human dimension in mediation, negotiation, will go on being tremendously important. Uh, Séverine, was there something you wanted to say on this? Um, yes, it's uh, building on the idea uh, of uh, digital, digital inclusion. I, when I hear questions about artificial intelligence, it uh, reminds me of a report that was written last year uh, and showing that uh, with COVID, as, uh, as you said, we learned a lot. And we learned a lot also about the, uh, the, the dangers of relying too much on technology. Um, and the fact that in many cases, uh, the turn to online, so online peace building, online everything, uh, has actually increased uh, exclusion, uh, discrimination, and basically reinforced the fracture lines. Uh, and that in many places, uh, they, the people who got excluded from uh, peace building, from uh, from from political processes where people who do not have access to technology or who do not know how to use technology uh, because of generational divides or because of uh, educational uh, lack of opportunities. And uh, so I think that if we, if we want to think about uh, how to use artificial intelligence, we, we have to be extremely, extremely careful about not further worsening the situation and further excluding many people, many communities, uh, many age groups who just don't know how to use technology and, and, and who feel even more disempowered and uh, who feel that they lack even more of a voice today than uh, two years ago or 10 years ago. Great. Uh, now, more questions. Uh, let's go to the middle of the room now. I see there's a gentleman in the middle here. And then we'll come over here to uh, the gentleman. And finally, the lady here uh, in the middle also. Please. And could you keep your question as short as possible? Thank you very much, sir. My name is Ishaku Gazama from Conflict Research Network, Nigeria. Uh, we do know that uh, if the poor, they are hungry, they cannot sleep. Also, the rich, they will not sleep because the poor are awake. In this respect, we also know that peace is the fruit of justice, just like fruit to a tree. Please, could I we want to, uh, have the question? I want to ask a question here concerning grassroots initiative. In my country, Nigeria, Prof from Uganda just mentioned that uh, in her country, there is community policy from the villages. I want to concur with her then I want to link it to our politicians in Nigeria. For the fact that communities in the rural areas have felt the severity of violence in northern Nigeria, for instance. They form vigilante groups to protect themselves. But the government is not helping matters. The government, they are forming state Please, policy. Please, sir, could we get to the question? <laughs> OK, the question is, how can we bridge the gap between grassroots development, peace initiative with that of the government in Nigeria, because the government, they are the one perpetrating conflict. The people in the grassroots, they are trying to help themselves, but the government, because they want to protect their leadership positions, Good. they are forming Please, state I policy. Please, I think we get the point. 
Could we now hear the other two questions? <laughs> we'll take them together okay. because we're at the end of our time. Okay. Nobody has a monopoly of the microphone, sir. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, can we please, there was a question over here. There, that gentleman, and then the lady here. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name's Daniel Watson from the University of Sussex. My question's to Severine. Um, so there's been a, you've been emphasizing the kind of local and the, the kind of virtues of ordinary people um, in terms of conflict resolution, but I wonder if that is a way of not talking about certain more thorny topics. For instance, uh, the, the role of elites in fermenting so-called local conflicts and the role of the arms trade or predatory extractive capitalism and so on. So I was wondering if you could address that. Thank you. Great. And ma'am, uh, here. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm Fonte Pejeneros from the World Bank. So I want to continue with the importance of uh, innovation technologies. So uh, my question is, how do we explain the role played by um, um, social media in inciting people to violence? So because um, social media also is... Uh, an exciting factor to more violence and war uh, nowadays. So how could we challenge this issue? Thank you. Great. So we're very close to the end of our time. Uh, could we respond briefly to whichever of these questions we feel we can <clears throat> respond to. Severine, there was one directly to you. Perhaps you'd lead off. They, they were two directly to me. Mm. Um, I, and, and the two of them are, are related. The reason, uh, so first to our friends from Sussex, uh, the, the reason why I emphasize the, the role of grassroots initiative, bottom up, and, and working with insiders is because we talk too much, uh, and we talk always at these kind of big conferences. We talk a lot about elite about elite level, about working with governments, and, and even more than talking, I mean, thankfully there are many, many researchers who are in this room and who also talk about grassroots, bottom up, etc. Um, but uh, but when, when we look at what's actually going on uh, in peace initiatives, that's where we see really the focus on, on top down, on working with elite, on discussing all of the topics that you mentioned, uh, and, and that our friend from Nigeria was mentioning, the, the idea that elites have their own vested interest, and and want to stay in power. So my, my, uh, my remarks today were meant as a corrective to this usual emphasis on top-down, on elite level. Uh, I'm not saying that we have to do away with top-down. I'm not saying that working with elite is completely useless, uh, because of course we need top-down and bottom-up. We need insiders and outsiders, and that's what I say in the entire book, is that we really need both, and we need to merge both. And, and for that, that's where I see a link for outsiders, uh, and for for international interveners and for, for the huge role of international organization. Uh, but we need to change the way we work. Uh, and that's what I, have, I, I was trying to, to get at in, in the previous question when I was saying, you know, staying in the back seat, taking our time, understand, listening, uh, understanding, coming with humility, etc. That's something whether you talk with elite level, where, we, where you talk with the most bloody corrupt leader, leader you can meet, or with the the, the angel person who me, you meet in the next room, all of them will tell you, I don't want an outsider who come in and tell me what you do. I don't want someone who come in and think that they know better. I want them to listen, and I want them to work with me rather than work for me or work on my behalf. Uh, and so that's why I think, okay, I've been short, but uh, that's why that's why I think all of the all of the things that we've learned about long time involvement, about uh, being humble, about uh, staying in the back seat, about learning local languages, local culture, etc. That's something that works just as well when we talk about elite with your, uh, you know, the, the the leaders, the bloody leaders you were referring to, or uh, the uh, the capitalist uh, leaders you were referring to. But that works only when you go to the most remote village in Congo or in Timor Leste. Great. Others? And I wanted just to answer to the question related to inciting violence and so on. I think it is true. We, in Mozambique, we, we tried to build up a process where we were very much in the back seat. But then is the role, for instance, of an envoy to stand up when is the right moment. 
and speak out. At that moment, you have to play the best your role of neutral, neutral voice, and then uh, try to, 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 let's say, say the truth again to the people. Because we face a similar problem like that with the, the military junta that was emerging in Mozambique. Of course, they were sometimes also speaking about issues that they could have been manipulated and used to incite violence, of course. And that was at the moment, the time, where as an envoy you have to stand up, go to the press, speak out clearly. That is, is one of the role of the mediator at the end of the day, I think. Great. Spain, any last thoughts? You know, we have not talked that much about the youth, have we? And if, when we talk about artificial intelligence and social media, we talk about the youth. My worry as a grandmother of the world is that humanity is going to go. Because the youth in my country, I was minister of youth, so they remember how we used to interact with them. And I was a youth at the time is that the, the cultural elements have gone because we have sort of romanticized this issue of social media. How do we communicate? We are not talking to our youth at home. We are not talking to the young people. We are pushing them to teachers, to professors, and each of us has our own way of defining what would make me dignified and also understanding why one needs to want peace badly, or to want ethics badly, or to want to relate to other human beings in a positive manner. So that's my worry about social media. I was at Harvard when all these WhatsApp started, a good number of years ago. I'd gone to do my doctorate in global health and population. So people imagine that the young people are putting there what they haven't got. I learned that in, 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 in technology, garbage in, garbage out. So how are we helping these young people to put quality things into what they actually communicate? The other thing is they are redundant. They have no jobs. I relate to youth, so young people who are very busy they'll tell you they don't go to social media all the time. But there are those who have something to communicate. And they are calling out to you people who are peace builders to communicate with them so that they can talk the language of the young people. So to me, social media is a wonderful asset which we should capture as a peace agenda for all of you. And research needs to be done I'm not a professor, by the way. I'm just a village professor. And, and for me, I communicate in the local languages. So I started a, a, a program on the science of health. Now I'm going to start a program on the science of law in the local language. In other words, are we talking the language the youth understand? Going to my first presentation of anthropology and diversity, the language we use we find that our young people, wherever they are, even those who have migrated, even yesterday when I was coming from the airport, there's this young Somali. He's been embraced by Finland, but he still feels Somali, but he doesn't know the language. And how do you talk to that young person to understand his role in supporting the Somali? Because if you immerse him there, mm -hmm he would not understand the language, the language of peace. And that is the language you put in the social media. So it, you, you get conflict. Those in the villages don't understand the language. The urban people are talking. So at the end of the day, we have a lot of research. I'm looking at the professor here and the U, UN university, so that we can really do more research on the ground to understand the fundamentals of what we are, what grounds us. And that will tell us the technology that we need and to also understand 
that this artificial intelligence is going to take away jobs of our young people and it may create more conflict. That is the little I have to say about that. Terrific. Thank you. Jana, briefly? Uh, two brief ideas. First, on, on youth. Uh, kind of some gloomy views from here on the podium, but I think one thing I really want to emphasize what we heard. I am so much encouraged by it. If you look at the youth, they are so good that they will... I'm, I'm, I'm confident that the world will be a better place because if I look at the youth nowadays, they are so much better than I was on their age. So this is somewhere we are going to the right direction. So there is a real room for optimism. Uh, I think let's embrace the youth and really see that the kind of real, the, uh, the, uh, the force of change they can really be. On the social media, it is a crucial element of, of, of conflicts nowadays. We know that the next, unfortunately I say next genocide, will be led by internet, by social media. It's not the radio anymore. This is what I'm afraid. Is there something we can do now to prevent that? Uh, clearly, there are issues of, uh, of uh, norms, or really certain practices for these platforms that we can do. We can push the platforms to really do something about that. The second thing is what we are doing as a CMI is a capacity building. This is a part of the agency I described, work with women's groups and others to really be able to work in the social media. But I think the bottom line is what Severin said, it's the bottom up. This is the digital world, it's a bottom-up. All of us are responsible, what we put there and what we share. And I think that sense of kind of global citizenship that you, that you should think what you do in, in a digital world, what, what you are kind of encouraging, that is something that we all, and I think that's, that's what we should be pushing, and I think that's a, that's a crucial... I want to leave with that thought. Thank you. Great. Thank you all very much. We've had a wonderful panel. Coffee break. So, panel, thank you very much. <laughs>